Um, with that, I'm going to introduce Stephen Thompson. He is the Executive v uh, Vice President of Ramey's Corporation. And Kendall Nash, she is the Vice President of Qualitative Services at Burke. My very first marketing research company I ever did one project with was with Burke. Yay. They taught me everything I am today. I started with Burke, so that's good. All right, everybody, so thank you very much, and the uh, floor is yours. Great. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to grab the little clicker here. Um, thank you guys. Good afternoon. I know after lunch it's a hard stretch and you've probably got email piling up. So we hope that um, the time that we spend with you this afternoon inspires you a bit to think a little bit differently as you head back to your own businesses. So we are talking about communities. I'm Kendall Nash. This is Steve Thompson. And we're going to talk about how this can take lots of different forms. So it, this was really born from a seemingly simple conversation. Um, Steve and I were talking about, you know, kind of what have you been up to? What are you seeing more of, less of? And I was talking about at Burke how we're doing a lot of mobile qual, a lot of in the moment things. We're trying to capture people when they're at aisle or experiencing things, um, when they're having passion or pain points as they go through a process. And so he asked the simple question, oh, mobile communities? And I said, I don't know, what do you mean by that? And so we really realized with that conversation that we were describing very different things sometimes when we talk about communities. And I know that's the case in a lot of conversations that I have with others in the industry. So um, it really led us on this quest to, first of all, uncover what really is a research community and then how do we design that to meet our specific needs. So one thing we did, we took a step back and we talked to, thought about what is a community? And what's true about a community despite the form? So whether it's the community you live in, whether it's a community in terms of the cohort of people you choose to gather around, or that you congregate with, whatever it may be, what, what's true about all of those types of communities? One is there's iterative sharing. There's growth that happens through time because you're sharing, you're building upon things with each other. There's an exchange of ideas that happens. And everybody's bringing a very different perspective and point of view into the conversation. There's authenticity that exists. It's a very genuine dialogue. You're having real conversations with people in a community. And that builds relationships. And as an outcome from that, there's a sense of accountability that's born as people start challenging each other because they know something is true about you. So when you say something that's inconsistent with that, they're able to challenge you because they have this relationship. So if these things are all true about a community, what then is a research community? And We've got a sample of some comments from a variety of clients, and I won't read them, but you can see from this that people are using the word community to describe a lot of very, very different things. In one example, it's really illustrating kind of what I think most people in our industry have traditionally thought of a community as in terms of it's hundreds of people, it lasts a long period of time. There's others, though, that are talking about something that's a week, where they're testing some concepts with a smaller number of people. So it's really all over the board. And even in, as you can see in the GRIT report and other industry reports, people are talking about actual and anticipated usage of communities, but they're probably meaning all different things. And so that's when it can get a little bit tricky. So what's the deal with chameleons? Why are we talking about chameleon communities? Um, I've learned a lot about chameleons on this little exploration. So obviously, they do have this highly developed ability to change their color. And it's actually a misconception that they change color to match their environment, which is actually, I thought that was why they did. Um, but it's actually that they're changing color to communicate something. It's part of a, how they mate, so they communicate their character and characteristics through changing color. So really, they use this, this ability to change to be what they need to be. And this was a good metaphor for us in terms of, let's define communities to be what we need them to be, rather than taking a one-size-fits-all and dismissing the idea of communities in some cases because it feels too big for what we need it to do. Instead, let's design around our objectives. And it truly is our duty as researchers to design tools that deliver insights. That's on us. And so it's important that we really do um, take the time to think about how do we design this in the right way to optimize what we're going to learn. So we thought it would be helpful to parse out maybe how we think about communities a little bit. 
What you see on the far outside ring, continuous insight communities. Um, these are on demand, kind of, you can reach out to them at any point in time and gather insights. And this is what a lot of people in our industry typically are thinking about when they talk about a research community. It's a long, long thing that seems to go on, sometimes forever, maybe too long in some cases. Um, at the, and the smallest ring there, at the core in the middle there, uh, the bottom, short term pop up communities. These are less than a few weeks in length. And I think a lot of people often might talk about these as bulletin boards, although sometimes we feel like that means it has to be a small number of people. So the nomenclature thing, I think, is what muddies the waters a lot for us when we're talking about communities. But I use a lot of these because these can be things that we can add and include as part of a wider research program. And then the middle ring there, longer term communities, I have a strong preference for these um, in many cases because they're still longitudinal, but you're talking about several weeks versus months and potentially longer than a year. So you still are able to build this, this story around each person and understand their background and what brings them to this point. So when they evaluate concepts, you really have a good sense of the context around where they're coming from. And there's a wide range of ways we can leverage communities to really help inform us when we need to. I mentioned the in the moment stuff early on. Shop alongs, it's great for us being able to capture things as they're experiencing them. Certainly for concept tests, it's an easy fit there. Co-creation, it's a great way to have people build upon their ideas with each other. And again, that idea of growth. So the idea seems to really kind of take on a life of its own. And I love seeing that and learning from that. And the beauty really comes in layering all of these types of things together. So it, first of all, makes it more engaging for the people who are participating. And there's been a lot of focus here about them as humans and all of these, these ways that we interact with them bring that to the forefront so we can learn from them. And so this is really a powerful way for us to engage with people um, through communities. Cool. Thank you. Um, just to okay. go back on that one, I think this really is the single most important slide in the deck, because what we're trying to convey is the versatility of communities, just how much you can do with them if you start thinking outside what maybe traditionally they've been defined as. So we did um, uh, just a quick look at how people have been using the Recollective platform to build out um, communities. And um, we looked at about a little over sorry, 500 uh, different studies um, that were running from the end of last year until the spring of this year. And we just tried to understand, is there some patterns? Can we see how people were using it? And they fell into, in terms of applications, just three broad buckets. There was behavioral attitudinal stuff, there was concept testing, and there was a lot of ethno. But hiding beneath that was a whole range of different applications, from ad testing, uh, communications testing, there was uh, home use tests, there was beta tests, there was all sorts of different things. Um, and we found that in terms of industries, it really didn't make any difference. There was obviously a lot in food and beverage and retail, as you might expect, but then we were also seeing a lot of communities built out in financial services and healthcare and high tech and communications and so on. So it didn't really seem to be just one industry that uses communities a lot. Um, and when we looked at the types of community in terms of the duration and the number of people, we found that they tend to fall into a couple of big kind of buckets. There was a huge amount, like kind of 60 odd percent, that were less than four weeks. So those are the, the pop-up communities that Kendall's talking about, where you can rapidly get um, a bunch of people in to give you some feedback about a specific um, research project that you're doing. But then a good third were also these really long-term communities, so the more traditional pieces. And we found that the split in terms of people was, again, similar. So the big communities tend to have, as you'd expect, the highest populations, the small ones, tended to be in the range of around 20 to 50 people. Um, and mobile didn't seem to matter with the size, the application, everybody was using it, even when it wasn't a mobile study. We found that there was a high proportion, 40% of people who would just do things on their phone because it's easy, they can do it in the moment. Um, so community software really seems to be able to be used everywhere from our perspective, from what we found. And when we looked to lay it down to try and see, okay, what are people doing inside those studies themselves? What kind of questions are they being asked and answered? Um, we found that, obviously, as you would expect, because it's community, it's all based around conversations. So you would expect, and, and we saw a lot of text-based uh, responses. 
But then there was this really nice spread of additional types of questions. So image reviews, there was quant in there with polls and grids and card sorts. There was multimedia where people were uploading videos in terms of journals and things. So this really nice ability to dive into the detail and find out why people thought certain things. And again, have a dialogue about that. So it wasn't just ask a question, get an answer. It was go back again and again and again and keep driving down until you to really discover what the, the driver was. The key thing of all of it, what was kind of characteristic of the most successful communities when we looked at in terms of participation rates or how um, happy the researcher was in terms of the data they were getting out, was that they built an environment that really suited their purpose. That it was um, easy to use, it was attractive, it helped people engage with each other, not only with the researcher but with each other and they could see and socialize those responses and really work together. That seemed to engage people and fire them up to want to give lots of good insights. So making it fun, as Kendall said, those really short-term ones really worked very well for that. They could make it fun. And even the long-term ones, if you break it up in the right way and you don't overload people with things, you know, they can be uh, kind of things that people want to keep coming back to and then they get disappointed when they finish their activity for the week and so on. So you can make research fun using some of the tools and communities and use the social elements of communities to add to that. So I've got a couple of minutes left. Um, I wanted to give you just a few examples of how people are using it. So this one's the first, it's kind of a really deep dive. So this is just one type of question within a community. This was a community where people were looking at an online food service where they were trying to rate how close they were to the brand itself or the service that was provided. So they had this kind of image review where they were marking themselves on a stairway of how close they felt to that uh, particular service and whether it was a good relationship they had or a neutral or a bad one. But they were able to then very quickly give um, not only their, where they were on that ladder but why they were there. And then they could probe on that through the community. Everybody could see how they felt and there was a discussion around it afterwards. So this only took about two minutes for a researcher to set up. These things don't have to be difficult. Um, and you can get some really powerful insights from them. The second was a, just to give you an example of a really short-term community. This was a potato chip company that wanted to look at some new flavors for their, for their crisps. Uh, I'm sorry, I call them crisps as a Brit. Day one, they had 13 different flavors. They had a group, it was less than 20 people into a community. They showed what those flavors were. They talked about the different flavors. They had a group discussion about it and they took them down to eight that they took into the second day. The second day again, they talked about the eight, they ranked them as a, individually and as groups, and then they took those down again to four, and then they talked about those in a little bit more and ranked the final rank. Uh, but again, in this one, it was really focused. The researcher was able to manage and moderate that really carefully and use just a couple of the tools to really great effect. But it was the community piece that was really driving it. And it was really fun for people to say that whether they would like these different flavors or not and talk about it. And then the last is on the opposite side of the scale. So this is a, a six-month community that we ran um, with an agency that was all about the, the launch of a new comedy TV show. So for two months before the, the TV show was launched, they had this uh, larger group of people track all of the media that they were watching, post and with hashtags like or funny and not funny. So they were able to track what generally people liked and didn't like before the launch. And then after the launch of the TV show, they were able to then get feedback on a week-to-week -week basis of, was this show funny? Was it funnier than last week? Which shows did you watch? What did you like about it? Talk about the topics that the shows were picking up on. Talk about um, what they would like to see and so on. Mm -hmm. And that helped the show be able to kind of adapt itself and program for the future. So all of those very different uh, kind of scales of community, sizes of communities, applications of communities. It's all just to try and reinforce the point that communities are, are very versatile. Yeah. So our hope today is that when you think about insight communities, first and foremost, that you will feel licensed to right size and right design them to meet your needs. That was one key thing we wanted to communicate to you because I know I, for one, have been a bit dismissive sometimes of communities because I don't feel like it fits exactly what I need to do and it feels like maybe overkill or over-engineering for something. But at its true core, community is about building that rich dialogue. So all of the things you do to design it should foster that authentic conversation um, because that is absolutely key. Yeah, it comes down to the conversation between people. That's really what you're trying to do. The technology, the tools, that's all just to stimulate that conversation. That's the real power of the community. 
Yep. And finally, like this uh, little guy with the creepy but awesome eyeball, we hope you're not afraid to be different and get out there and create communities that really help you deliver for your brands. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, would anyone like to uh, ask a question from the audience? For real though, anybody want to ask a question? <laughs> I have one. I have one for you, Sandy. Okay, real quickly, I had this um, question was, what's the worst use you guys have seen of community? Oh. Worst story. Can I share that? Um, I, I can share one, which is just, one, um, I think, especially early days, I think there were clients that would come to us and just thought, if we just build this thing and then later we'll figure out what we want to do with it. And I think that, that might be a more common example than we would like, um, thinking, okay, this will just give us quick access to people, but they didn't have a strategy behind it. And so um, there wasn't a real champion to kind of own it and run with it, which makes the whole thing potentially a waste of, of energy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Two examples. One yeah. was if you don't have enough resources to, to run the community, um, it's a killer. Um, and if you're pulling people in lots of different directions, so you often with those really big ones, you'll see that lots of different departments from your client will want to get involved and they'll all have different questions and types of questions and the, the participants just don't know which way to go. Um, you haven't really recruited the right kind of people for, to satisfy everyone, so that generally doesn't end in a, in a happy place. Um, and then the second would be if you just, is the point I was trying to make earlier about making it fun. Um, I've seen communities where, in theory, it's a community, but it's just a ton of poll questions, a ton of open-ended text questions, and people are just literally falling asleep by the end of the, of the first activity. And that's killer as well, because they don't even want to socialize at that point. Nobody wants to read a stream just full of text. Mm -hmm. They want to see visuals. They want to have quick responses and reactions to things. So try to keep it fun as well, and that will help. Right. Any other questions in the audience? Excellent. All right. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Nice job.